we're yet to see his equal, and perhaps we never will. A record-breaking, wicket-taking star with a gift for the spectacular. The game of cricket has never known anyone quite like him. He was the greatest cricketer of my generation. And he's just got it. He's just got that special X factor. He was the greatest bowler of all time, without a doubt. In the early 1990s, a young man from Australia revived and mastered an art which had lain dormant for decades, leg spin bowling. And in doing so, he changed the game of cricket forever. He was just uh, the ultimate attacking weapon. He was a wonderful bowler, magnificent. He's, he's the best I've ever seen. Shane Keith Warne would finish his career with a record 708 test wickets. Yet he came to be defined by his very first delivery on English soil in 1993. Forever known as the ball of the century. I didn't really get a good look at it and had, didn't really have a, an initial appreciation of how good it was until way later, uh, once we saw the replay. I mean, out in the ground, Warney's first ball, you beauty, you know, one for none, thanks for coming. But then the boys started to talk, you know, particularly Ian Healy behind the, uh, the wickets as the keeper, sort of saying, oh, AB, that was, that was seriously good delivery. He just swung enough to bring Gat towards it just enough. His front foot didn't move out just enough. His bat was just a bit slow. It spun just enough to hit just the top of the off stump. And uh, it was <laughs> you know, history. You ask Warren, what would you like to bowl to Mike Gatting first up? Um, you'd like it to drift in about a yard, pitch outside leg, see Ian Healy going down the leg side to take it, hit the top of off stump and watch Mike Gatting look and not realise he's out. And it was just one of those remarkable moments, and heightened by the fact, of course, it was his first ball, um, and I, there was a sense there that a great leg spinner had been born. From that moment on, Shane Warne was public property. Warne was this uh, new, new national hero, and then, of course, the cricket world was all over it as well. People wanted to know more about, who is this bloke? You know, what, what does he do? You know when he's not playing cricket, and so the, the, the scrutiny became more and more obvious for someone like him compared to, you know, previous eras. A gregarious personality, sporting a shock of blonde hair, Warren came from humble beginnings, but quickly made his mark. Word of his rare talent spread. First impressions, uh, he's just a likeable bloke, straight away when you meet him. Uh, he was a different version back then, he was a bit more roly-poly. Looked like a, you know, a bit of a beach bum with the, the long blonde hair um, compared to the, you know, sophisticant uh, bloke you get now. But uh, he, he was just a likeable bloke straight away. Once I got to know Shane Warne, I wasn't surprised that, he's, that his rise to the top was, was very quick. I mean, the first thing about him was he was a pretty accurate leg spinner. You could see that from the boundary. But once I chatted to him a bit, you, you quickly thought, hello, this guy's, he's got a very good cricket brain and he, you know, he knows what's going on. After only seven first-class matches for Victoria, in 1992, Warren was selected to play for his country against India, the 350th test cricketer to play for Australia. But he struggled against the class of Ravi Shastri and a young Sachin Tendulkar, taking just one wicket for 150 runs. It was as if it was bad bowling. He wasn't bowling half trackers, full tosses, that type of stuff. They, they just played him very well. He was the unfinished product when he first played cricket for Australia. Um, so it was just a matter of, um, you know, like learning. I thought to myself, uh, I just hope they persevere with him a bit because all spinners need a bit of tender loving care and they need 
support from their captain, but they also need support from the selectors. The selectors did persevere, picking Warren for the 1992 tour to Sri Lanka, when his true potential first became apparent. They probably needed 20 odd to win, they were six or seven wickets down, and uh, threw Warney the ball, and I mean, within a blink of the eye, he had three or four wickets, and uh, we win the game, you know, that, uh, against, the, against the flow. And uh, Warney then got a lot of confidence out of that situation, being thrown the ball in that circumstances to start with, and then performing. And, uh, you know, he grew an extra leg from that point. And probably that was the, the turning point for him. When he finished up bowling Australia to victory in the second innings, uh, I think that was probably the most crucial thing in, in, in Shane Warne starting to really believe in himself. Warne's blossoming power as an attacking weapon became clear in 1992. Australia faced the West Indies, at that time the world's best team, and the stage for the second test was his home ground, the MCG. I still remember the sliding flipper that just ran along the ground for Richie Richardson's wicket. Um, that seven for in Melbourne, uh, he, he never looked back. He, he just cemented what he'd started in Sri Lanka. And then, you know, from then on, if you were going to get on top of Shane Warne, you had your hands full. Nobody recognised the fact that it was a flipper. The ball that he deliberately bowled out of the front of his hand, that pitch short, and you thought, yes, this is short, I'm going to get lots of runs here. I just skid it on. Everybody thought, oh, that's a bad ball, he was lucky. We didn't know, and that was Shane Wan. Shane Wan kept on developing different deliveries that people, after a while, discovered that, yeah, that's a legitimate delivery. And he's such a fast learner. His own confidence started to come out. His own personality started to develop. And, you know, it, it was just a rapid rise, really, when you think about from start to, you know, becoming a world-class bowler, very short space of time. Maybe one of the most relevant things that's ever been about the Warren career is his early nickname, Hollywood, which we didn't really use, we just called him Warney, but, but Hollywood, there, there is definitely a movie in Warren. He made himself part of it all. He realised that cricket and being out on a cricket ground like here at Lords, you know, you are centre stage and you are trying to entertain people. It's not just about winning, it's about people paying the money to watch and getting their money's worth and definitely watching a spell from Shane Warne Bowl. Even if he didn't get a single wicket, you got your money's worth. Perhaps what was revolutionary was the kind of showbiz he brought to the occasion. You know, he was a very magnetic personality. Um, when he was bowling, you kind of felt there was real ownership of the moment there from, from Warne. Warren had quickly become the focal point for all opposing teams. His every delivery was meticulously scrutinised before play, but still the wickets came. He played a few mental games. There'd always be at the start of the series, he'd come up with some brand new delivery, the, the Zooter, the Hooter, the whatever he would come out with, and we would laugh and we'd try and get video analysis and get the coach Fletcher or someone, come on, get us some you know, footage of this new delivery, and you'd work out it'd just be the one that doesn't turn or something. So there would always be mind games. It was the amount of spin that he got. It, it didn't matter too much whether you picked his googly. You could, he didn't bowl many googlies, but the the problem with him for all batters was accuracy, dip, make it swing in before it ripped away. And I, I never saw him on any surface that he didn't spin it. And what a wonderful change of pace that was. That's the real art of leg spinning. Well, it's a marvellous piece of bowling from Shane Warne. Warney was really easy to pick. You, you know, you can pick him from the clubhouse. And that's what makes him even better than his statistics. Um, and I think Glenn McGrath the same, you know. Warren, you could see every batsman bar Darrell Cullinan uh, and Robin Smith, I think, could, could see what was coming. And yet they couldn't do anything. He still got 700 odd out, you know, so that's how good he was. Oh, and they hit the pad. Yes, he's got it. It's no surprise that Warren's name is also among Test cricket's very few hat-trick men. Oh, and that's out, caught behind. 
I mean, hat tricks are so rare. He was one of those bowlers. He was always going to do something like that. A 10 wicket haul in an innings, or you know, something special. He was always going to produce something special, and uh, yeah, getting a hat trick, particularly against England, that, that's the one to do against the, the old foes. He wouldn't shy away from any situation, whether it be against a, an England team in the Ashes or up against Brian Lara, West Indies, or Sha Sachin Tendulkar. He would love the challenge of coming out on top, and he, he did. You look at his wickets, he did. Warren was very smart. Um, you know, they so used the psychology of the game as well. He would pick on certain players who he felt might have been a bit uh, temperamental or had a short fuse or would react uh, to the odd little word here or there. He didn't say much to me because I'm kind of quite a calm, unflappable type of a character. But, for example, to Nasser saying or Mark Ramprakash, he might just try and uh, chirp away and chip away. He was very honest with the batsmen. He sort of told them quite a lot of times, I'm going to do this, if you want to have a go, you, you have it. And he'd deliver exactly the same, but the batsman would be thinking, oh, is he double bluffing me, you know? But we've never seen a spinner, let alone a leg spinner, have the confidence like that. Oh, beautiful ball. That's a wonderful delivery from Sam Warren. At the 1999 World Cup, Warren cemented his position as the world's best bowler. Through sheer force of will, he took control of the semi-final against South Africa, demonstrating not just his talent, but his desire. When he got that wicket, he really, he sort of marched down the pitch and he said, come on, you guys, and you got the feeling, hello, Warney's going to drag him with him here, uh, because Warney always believed the match could be won. Saying it is one thing, that can sort of drag him along a bit, but then when he got the other wicket, I think that's when everybody in the Australian side suddenly started to think, oh, we can, we can win this. There are moments in cricket matches, particularly like those big games, that you can just say, OK, that's, that's where the game changed, and that's what Warren did so often. Four wickets for just 29 runs against South Africa were followed by four for 33 in the final against Pakistan mesmerising spells of bowling, which led to two Man of the Match awards and Australia being crowned world champions. Oh, well bowled, it's gone right through each as. But Shane Warne continuing on where he left off at Edgbaston. A big shout, I, there was a noise, yes, he's been given. On the field, Warne led a charmed life. He was the world's best bowler, and with that came the plaudits. Nobody could deny his amazing talent, but the pressure to perform would take its toll, both on and off the field. He had no antenna up there uh, to warn him, you know, what you're about to do could be a little bit silly and could lead to trouble warning. He stood there with the stump and waving around and all that, you know, and he was on the balcony doing his little dance that he did. And the Barmy Army used to give him absolute heaps. They had about 50 songs about Warney, most of which you can't repeat, but Warney loved it. Warney would go like that to him. People got to know him a little bit more because of the, the media, and uh, he, he didn't take on board the fact that I, I probably need to change in certain ways um, to, to play the game. Um, and that's what got him in hot water every now and then. In 2000, Warne was the only active cricketer named as one of the five cricketers of the century by a 100-member panel of experts. He was in good company, alongside Sir Donald Bradman, Sir Garfield Sobers, Sir Jack Hobbs and Sir Vivian Richards. But his off-field activities attracted unwanted headlines, and despite his record-breaking statistics, Warne was on a collision course with the game's administrators. Yeah, there was a period there where it became SK Warren v Cricket Australia. Uh, there were some significant misdemeanours. Um, 
And that was unusual that it wasn't the captain that was stirring up Cricket Australia. He was a player. He was just a player, but that's how significant a player he was. He seemed to be impervious to all the criticism that was stung at him, uh, was flung at him over the years for all of his misdemeanours. And the tragedy of that, of course, was that he excluded himself fundamentally from the Australian captaincy. And he would have been a great captain. I mean, that's acknowledged by everyone, strategically and tactically. A gifted man, a gifted cricketer. I'll bet. Whoever was captain at the time, whether it be Mark Taylor or a bit of Steve Waugh, uh, Ricky Ponting, I bet they tapped into him. And, and of course, if any of them went off and he became captain, he'd change everything, change the ball, he'd change the field. Uh, just uh, he'd do his little thing, yeah. He's your go-to man as far as, even if you're talking tactically as a captain, um, he would be the guy that you'd go and run things by. I did see him captain a few games, a few one-day internationals, I think, when uh, Steve Waugh stepped down for, for a while. Um, and I thought he was great. He was interesting, exciting. I think he captained quite a few times Australian one-day cricket. And, you know, just a flawless record. He, he's got those instincts that, uh, you know, that he, he, he can bring certain things to the table, um, inventive um, an instinctive sort of captaincy. I'm sure the Australian Cricket Board were frightened to death of, of giving him the job. Warren was a key figure in Australia's unprecedented success at both test level and in the one-day game. But a dislocated shoulder in 2002, his second serious shoulder injury, threatened to undermine Australia's dominance. Uh, there's a problem out there and uh, Warren uh, has gone down on his shoulder. He's a very, very strong character and you know, he's a you know, very focused guy. So when he sets his mind to do something, either coming back from injury or you know, some personal drama or whatever it might, the case might be, he, he's just a strong character and that comes through. A full recovery required all Warren's fighting qualities. Fitness and form were recaptured. But the world's premier slow bowler now knew he had to adapt. So he didn't bowl the googly so much. He bowled his. Uh, he didn't bowl what you might call the classic flipper so much as well. The one that uh, he flipped out between middle finger and thumb. But he just kind of pushed one out of the front of the hand a bit more. So he had less variation, I think, after the shoulder injury. Um, but he, you know, had all that experience. He was very canny by then, very wily, more accurate. But it was his return from injury which almost ended his career. In February 2003, just a day before the World Cup began, Warren was sent home from South Africa after he returned a positive drug test for a banned diuretic. I feel sorry for him in that I don't think he's trying to cheat the game. I think it was, a, it was an honest mistake and you know, he paid a, a pretty hefty price. You know, 12 months out of the game, a lot of players wouldn't come back from that. Oh, yeah. After serving a year's ban, the expectation surrounding Warren's return to the national team reached fever pitch. Through the art of slow bowling, Warren had single-handedly transformed the game. But was he the same player? He was a different bowler. He didn't quite spin the ball as far. He didn't get the kind of drift that he got for the Gatting ball. He couldn't bowl the googly. He didn't bowl the classic flipper. That's, that is the straight one, the slider. But he was wily, you know, as I say, had that great reputation and aura by the end. Um, so different, uh, and that's not to say uh, any less good than he was. What really, he really got better at, I think, was his love of the fight. And you look at towards the end of that series, he came here in 2005, and when all of Australia, the rest of the side, was dis being dismantled by Michael Vaughan's England, Shane Warne stood up with bat and ball. And I think that stands out for me. Well, to come back and get those wickets in the 2005 series was a bit disappointing for me that the rest of the team didn't stack up with him. The support Warne didn't get. Uh, is, was very glaring uh, around the around the dressing room, and it was a real shame for Warren to do it though, and, and carry carry that Test match series uh, was again just a tribute to him. Uh, Warren's fitness and form had been called into question, but in a series Australia would lose, he took an astonishing 40 wickets and scored 249 runs.
Without him, Australia would have been dead and buried. And he just kept going and going. I just think he, he kept us in that series. Otherwise, England would have uh, steamrolled us quite easily. He, he kept us in the hunt. It's all right playing well when everyone else is playing well. But when Shane Wall can still achieve what he did in 2005, when everyone else was just starting to fall apart a little bit, speaks volumes for Warren. It hurt him that uh, you know, we'd lost the ashes after so many years of domination and that uh, it fueled the fires to keep going for you know, one more go at the, the old enemy. That opportunity arose on home soil in 2006. Rarely in any sport has revenge been so sweet. Warren's final test series saw Australia reclaim the ashes. And fittingly, it was Shane Warne himself who delivered the final blow. The end of it, when the ashes had been won, all the Australian players kind of went in a huddle and started congratulating themselves, and the England players, two of the batsmen were out in the middle, came to try and shake their hands and couldn't get near them, but Warren was the one who kind of broke away to commiserate uh, with the beaten opponents, first of all. Um, so I, I sensed a, a respect for the game. I think that grew. I mean, there were some boorish moments early on in his career, but I sensed that that respect for opponents and the game grew over time. The bottom line with Shane was you enjoyed playing against him because he would give you all of that on the field, but he would never be off the field. He would never take, he'd never hold a grudge off the field. If you got runs against Shane Warne or Australia, he'd be the first to come up to you, shake you by the hand and say, well played. And with the Ashes back in Australia, it was time for Warne to declare the innings closed. I think my journey and my, uh, my ride in international cricket has been uh, phenomenal. I don't think I could have written my script any better. I don't think I could have given any more to cricket. I've given as much as I possibly could have given. You know, for the fans that are going to miss me, that makes me feel nice. The end was nigh, but Warren was not quite finished with international cricket. On Boxing Day 2006, he became the first cricketer to reach the 700 wicket milestone. And he did it at his home ground, the MCG. It's a classic example of the Warren self-belief. You know, some guys believe that they can do things, and Warren he probably sort of said to himself, well, wouldn't it be fantastic to go out at the MCG, get him a 700th wicket, uh, and he did it. His final test appearance saw Warne help Australia to a 5-0 Ashes win as he bowed out at the Sydney Cricket Ground. A career spanning exactly 15 years ended where it began. The clamouring for his return hasn't ceased in, in the years that he's been retired, so... That's the mark of you know, the, the, the gaping hole he's left in, in our cricket team. He was still getting the very best players out at the back end of his career. And he, he just decided that, well, he must have been 38 or so, that's enough. A beautiful finish to a, a turbulent career at times, but outstandingly powerful. In the air. Unsurprisingly, Australia's greatest ever leg spinner did not disappear completely. The rise of 2020 cricket, and in particular the new Indian Premier League, grabbed Warren's attention. It proved to be a suitable match. He's got fantastic leadership qualities, and uh, there's a certain amount of flair about the way he does things, uh, as we've seen time and time again. So it wasn't surprising to me to see him in charge of a uh, an outfit in India with uh, a host of you know, young Indian cricketers that no one knew much about, uh, some hand-picked uh, senior guys that uh, overseas players, with Warren leading, um, and and no one really knew a lot about 2020 cricket and the tactics um, that have evolved subsequently. But Warney would have been right on the the cutting edge of that straight away. Shane Warne made his name at the Melbourne Cricket Ground. It's here where his likeness has been immortalised in bronze. A fitting tribute to a true Australian sporting icon. He's just so popular and, and so famous. Um, you know, it doesn't matter that he's, he's an ex-cricketer now. He's sort of gone past that. He's just, he's just a famous person. He was a remarkable practitioner in every way and a charismatic soul. 
he walks into a room, there's something very different. He is a charismatic man who had an enormous skill and uh, he applied it uh, to his very best. They broke the mould when uh, they, they churned out um, Shane Keith Warren. Um, yeah, special, special. And uh, we probably won't see anything quite like him again, um, but fingers crossed, we ho I hope we do.